Okay, so last time we talked about uh, the following map uh, from R2 to R2, which is given by f of x y equals x minus y comma x plus y, and we noticed the following fact that it does the following to uh, a square of side one, it maps it to again a square, but of a larger side length square root two, and also rotated by an angle of forty five degrees. So this is the image of this unit square under this map. Okay, so this point is one comma one. So this is in fact a side of uh, a square of side root two, and which in fact makes an angle of forty-five degrees with the x-axis. So call it pi by four. Okay, so we therefore said that it seems like there are two operations uh, happening here at once. So, this is the natural notion of composition of maps. So, so recall what did composition mean of functions? Suppose I have functions, let us call it g1 is a function from r2 to r2, and I have another function g2 from r2 to r2. So, all these are r2. Then their composition, so let us call it G2 composition G1. So let us define H to be G2 composition G1. So what is this? This is the following map is a map is the map which is defined by. So firstly, what where is it a map from? It is again a map from R2 to R2. And what does it do? It takes a point x comma y on the plane and sends it to, so it is g2 composition g1, so it is g2 evaluated at whatever g1 does to x comma y, right. So this is the usual notion of composition. You follow one map up by the second one. So uh, this is another way of saying it is so you apply g1 first and then you apply g2, right. So if you do first g1 and then g2. So this is sort of what we meant last time by saying that that map f that we looked at seemed to be doing two things at once. What it really was doing was doing you know two things one after the other. So let us see what, uh, so what I want to do next is to try and express this map f as a composition of two simpler maps or two more familiar maps that we have already looked at. So for that purpose let us actually define these two maps. Uh, so I want to take uh, specific examples of G1 and G2. Let me define G1 to be the following map. It is x minus y divided by square root 2, comma x plus y divided by square root 2. Okay, so that's G1 and G2. Uh, sorry, that's G1 and G2 of x y. I define it to be just square root 2 x times square root 2 y. Okay. So I am taking two particular examples of g1 and g2, one of them given by the first formula, the second given by the second formula. So observe that g2 is something that we have already looked at, it is just the uniform dilation by a factor of square root of 2. So g2 of course is familiar, this is just a dilation or a uniform dilation. by square root 2. So everything gets expanded by square root 2. So we will return to G1, but first observe what is the composition of these two maps. So suppose we did G2 composition G1, so let us call H as G2 composition G1 and see what this map H is. By definition it is G2 of G1 of xy. So let us evaluate g1 first, g1 is x minus y by root 2, x plus y by root 2, that is what uh, g1 does and g2 simply multiplies each factor by root 2. So this then gives you x minus y comma x plus y, okay. So in other words, 
what is this? Well, this is the original function f that we started out with. So this is exactly the function f. So what this means of course is that the original function f is rather it, it really is a composition of two simpler functions. It is g2 composition g1. Now let us try and understand g1 better. g2 of course we have now understood. So it is a, it's a dilation. Now what does g1 really do? Okay, so that is the only remaining part of the puzzle right now. Okay, so the only question that remains here is to understand what g1 is. Now let us start out with the formula g1 of x comma y is just x minus y by square root 2 comma x plus y divided by square root 2. But to understand it more geometrically, let us do the following. Let us take a point x, y on the plane. Uh, let us say imagine it is at a distance r from the origin and which makes an angle theta with the x axis. So we have the following trigonometric relations that x is just r cosine theta, y is r sine theta. And now we apply g1 to the point x, y. So by the formula, this is just x minus y by square root 2 comma x plus y. So x is now r cos theta plus y by square root of 2. Now let us do the following. Uh, let us analyze each of these. Remember 1 by square root 2 that appears in this formula can actually be thought of as the following. It is cosine of 45 degrees. It is cosine of pi by 4 or in fact the same as sine of pi by 4. Okay, so cosine and sine of 45 degrees are both just 1 by square root 2. So what we can now do is to rewrite the x coordinate. So what did we have? We had r cos theta uh, by root 2 minus r sin theta by root 2 as the following. It is really r times cosine of theta cosine of pi by 4 minus sine of theta sine of pi by 4 and this is just r. So now we use the trigonometric identity for the cosine of a sum. So cosine of theta plus pi by 4 would exactly be cosine theta cosine pi by 4 minus sin theta sin pi by 4. So in fact what this tells us is that if you take g1 of x, y, if you look at g1 of the point x comma y, what it is mapping to is a point x dash comma y dash which is given by the following. The x coordinate of the, the new point is just r cos theta plus pi by 4 and if you sort of work out the y coordinate similarly, you will find that it is just r sin theta of plus 5 by 4. Okay, again you will need to use the addition formula for sin. So what does this mean? Geometrically it says that the original point which was at an angle theta from the origin and at a distance r has now been mapped to, well this new point is still at a distance r but the angle is theta plus pi by 4. Right? So this is the original point x, y has now been mapped to well a point here. So it is just moved like this by an angle of 45 degrees. The length remains unchanged. In other words, this is just a rotation by 45 degrees. So therefore what is, uh, we have managed to answer the original question. G1 in fact is nothing but is uh, the rotation by G1 is just a rotation by 45 degrees anticlockwise. Okay. So finally, coming back to our analysis of f, remember f was just the composition of these two maps. So recall that this function that we started out with is just the composition g2 composition g1. So in other words, the, the function f that we looked at is just the following. You first perform a rotation by 45 degrees and then follow it up with a dilation by a factor of square root 2. Okay. So that simple looking formula that we wrote out for the function f, it is just x minus y comma x plus y. But if you really analyze a little deeper, you find that it 
the function f can be broken down into two simpler constituents, one being a rotation by 45 degrees and the other being just a simple dilation, okay. So, uh, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us uh, lots of things because we know many properties of rotations and dilations. So, here is a consequence uh, observed. This means that f preserves angles. If I have say two lines which make some angle theta and I apply f to it, what I will get will be two more lines which still make the same angle theta. And why is that? Because the first operation rotation does not change angles. The second operation dilation as we just saw also does not change angles. So, when you do the first followed by the second, the angle cannot change. Neither of the two constituent pieces can change the angle. Okay. So, f does preserve angles. What does f do to lens? F dilates lens by a factor of root 2. So, lens are multiplied by a factor of root 2. Again, why is that? Because, well, a rotation does nothing to lens. It preserves lens, keeps lens the same. Whereas, then when you follow it up with the dilation, the length will become multiplied by square root. And of course, areas, so when lengths get multiplied by, by square root 2, you would sort of expect the areas to get multiplied by a factor of 2, okay. So that is what happens in this case, that the areas do get multiplied by a factor of 2, okay. So uh, what this tells us is often, you know, the simpler sorts of transformations we talked about, dilations or inhomogeneous dilations, rotations, translations things like that are often very good building blocks with which you can try and understand somewhat more complicated transformations of the plane, okay. So now uh, one final example, let us take the function f of x, y, defined to be x squared comma y squared, okay. So, this formula is now again simple in a sense, but fundamentally different from all the examples we have looked at until now. So, observe everything we have done until now has never had squares of the variable occurring in these two places. You have always had you know, something which looks like some multiple of x plus some multiple of y for instance or some you know multiple of x plus a constant. So, what we have had so far have always been linear polynomials if you wish in the variables x and y in the first component and in the second component. Whereas here the first time we see a, a square appearing, okay. So point to note here is that this is fundamentally different from all the, all the examples so far. So this is certainly very different. So I should say this is fundamentally different from all preceding examples of transformations and we will soon see this, this difference uh, being expressed. So for instance, here is the first thing, let us try and figure out what this map does to lines, okay. That is often been our first step in all these prior examples. So let us take a line, so I am going to pick the line y equals x plus 1, it has slope 1 and a, a y-intercept of 1. So here is my line L and let us see what this function f does to this line L. Okay, what, what sort of thing do you get on the other side, okay. So what is the, what is the approach? Let us write, just as we did earlier, we will try and write an equation for the image. So, let us call x prime y prime to be the, the image, let us call it f of x y. In other words, this is x squared y squared, okay. So, x prime is x squared. So, so this just means of course that x prime is x squared and y prime is y squared. So, now what we know is that the variables x and y are connected by an equation, right. When they vary, when x and y vary, they vary in such a way that y is always equal to x plus 1. This is the equation that we know. 
and what we now want to derive from here is an equation which tells you how x prime and y prime are connected right how do they vary is the question so let's try and figure out what this implies in terms of want an equation in terms of x prime and y prime okay and so of course that's equation for x prime y prime so it's again easy just like we did earlier so we'll just rewrite y as the square root of y prime uh, square y prime is y squared so it's square root of y prime equals the square root of x prime plus 1 okay so imagine uh, so this is really the equation that you have which connects the the variables y prime and x prime observe here y prime and x prime since they are squares of these variables are definitely positive so observe that x prime and y prime are definitely greater than or equal to 0 okay so here is the equation that tells you how y prime and x prime vary so the best way to do this of course to square both sides we'll see what that gives us so it tells you y prime equals x prime uh, square root of x prime plus 1 squared so that's this plus 1 plus 2 root x prime okay so that's the equation which tells you what you know how y prime and x prime vary and observe this is clearly not the equation of a line okay because of the this factor here you have the 2 root x prime this is clearly not the equation of a line okay so what this really implies is the original line that we had y equals x plus 1 okay that is the line L when you map it under this function f what it transforms to what it deforms to is something very different it is some curve now okay so y prime and x prime are both positive and they are connected by this equation y prime equals x prime plus 1 so observe if you only had the first two terms of course that is the same line you know y equals x plus 1 but there is this additional additional term there so if you sort of draw it it probably looks something like that so that is the curve okay. so this is the curve which is the image of the line L okay. this curve is the image of the line L under this map F okay. so the very first point here is that it does not map lines to lines so that is already a, a, a very fundamental difference which means it actually makes life somewhat harder for us because you no longer can figure out what happens to polygonal regions just by figuring out what happens to just the end points just the vertices alone because the line connecting those two points could have deformed to some funny curve connecting the, the vertices okay. But uh, never mind so let us look at one further region so let us look at the circle of radius 1 so I want to take circle of radius 1 and figure out what happens to that under this map f so my question now is what is the image of the circle under this particular map f okay so let us try and do the same thing now the circle again is a curve that is given by the following equation it is all points x comma y on the plane which satisfy x squared plus y squared equals 1 okay. so that is the, the circle and now I, again I will do the same thing I will look at the image of this point x y I will call it x prime y prime and now so what does that mean x prime is x squared y prime is y squared and now the question is can you now find an equation that tells you how x prime and y prime vary as x and y satisfy the, the given equation. So observe that x prime is x squared, y prime is y squared of course means the following as before x prime and y prime are positive but further since the original two points lie on a circle x, x squared plus y squared is 1 so in other words x prime plus y prime is actually <coughs> okay so here is the, the, the conclusion about the point x prime y prime as x comma y runs around the circle the point x prime y prime its image lies on well it firstly it lies in the first quadrant because x and y are positive 
but further it lies on a particular line, it lies on the line x plus y equals 1. So, here is the line x plus y equals 1 and this point x prime y prime must lie on this line, it, it can only vary on this line, that is what it implies. But further remember it lies only in the first quadrant, so I do not even have the parts which are it is not even a line anymore, it is only this particular line segment that it must lie on. Okay. So, let us look at the two end points, here is the point uh, 1 comma 0 and here is a point 0 comma 1 and you have the line segment joining those two points. What this transformation f must be doing is it must somehow map this entire circle just to that line segment alone. Okay. So, it is somewhat surprising at first glance. So, let us figure out what happens, you know, how can it, how can a circle really just map to a, a, a just a small line segment like this. So, so imagine what happens here as x, so uh, let us look at the four parts of the circle, uh, the four quadrants, so here is the yellow portion, as x and y both live in the first quadrant and, you know, let us say I, I move from this point here towards the, the point above. I move like this along the circle. Let us see what happens to those points. So, this point here A, which is the point 1 comma 0 under this function f maps to well 1 comma 0, I square both components, I get, get this point. So, let me call it P and Q. So, when I move from A to B along my circle, A maps to P, B maps to Q under this, this map and so, what I get is I will move along this line or line segment from P towards Q. So, this is how the point moves when you move from A to B along the circle. Okay. Now, let us keep doing this. So, you move between let us say B and C. So, observe C is now the point minus 1 comma 0 and under this function f, C again maps to P because it is it's going to square both components. So, as you move from B to C, you will observe that all you are doing is just moving back down along this. So, you first move from P to Q and then you move back down to P. Okay. And well, it is similar, when you move from C to D, you move back up and when you move from D to A, you move back down. So, you sort of do four iterations, you go up, you go down, you go up again and then you go down finally. So, traversing the four quadrants of the circle amounts to under this map f, what it does is it traverses this line segment up and down four times. And to really understand what this is doing, so if you also look at the region inside the circle, what it is going to do is just map it to this, this triangular region here. Okay. So, again something for you to check an exercise, take points inside the circle, for instance the origin maps to the origin and so on. Now, what is the geometrical way of really understanding what this map does? Okay, so, after all, all of these various examples we are doing are with the following thing in mind, we want to get some geometrical intuition for how this function deforms the plane into other points of the plane. Okay, and to do that, we are really looking at certain sub regions of the plane and figuring out what deformations they suffer under this function f. So, here, here is really what happens. So, let me just give you the description and uh, leave it for you to convince yourself that this is in fact what it is. So, uh, it is really the following step, you first take the circle, so imagine I have a circular disc, so a, a paper say which is in the shape of a circle and imagine you have these two diameters, now you fold this circle, so you really perform a fold say along one diameter and then along the other such that it is just a, a quadrant. Okay, so, there are two folds that you perform, first along the first diameter, it will make it a semicircle and then along the other diameter to then make it into a, a just a single quadrant. And now, what you do is this quadrant under this function f, you sort of flatten out this circular arc into a triangular region. Okay, so, the, of course, the flattening is not a uh, I mean that is just a geometrical uh, uh, term which just tells you that you you are sort of doing something to that circular portion and making it a square. So, the exact thing is of course given by the formula x squared y squared, but
but what you are doing here is you are flattening this function f is now flattening this quadrant into a triangle. Okay, so finally that is the right angle triangle that you get joining the point 0, 1 and 1, 0. So it is really a two step process here again, one the circle is folded along the diameters into a single quadrant and then this quadrant is flattened into a triangular region and so this, this combined deformation is really what the function f achieves, okay. So it does both in one stroke, okay. So the key thing here is uh, with this example at least the, the key point is to realize that this uh, thing of lines mapping to lines that we keep you know talking about or we kept talking about in all the earlier examples is not something to be taken for granted, okay. It is not always true that any given transformation may not map lines to lines. It can do some rather strange things to lines, make them other kinds of curves and so on as we saw in this example. And so every time you have a transformation which you are trying to understand, it is important to check for instance that it does in fact transform lines to lines. If at all you want to see what is going to happen to triangles or squares or other polygonal regions, checking that lines map to lines is somehow the very first step, okay. That is something that one must always do before one starts, uh, you know, manipulating and playing with these functions a little bit more, okay. So we will return to this theme of lines mapping to lines again. Specifically, next time we will talk about transformations which have that property that they map lines on the plane to lines on the plane. These are called affine linear transformations and, you know, sort of uh, special cases of those are what are called linear transformations. So these form a very important class of transformations which uh, can be understood from many different points of view and using other tools, tools from other parts of mathematics, specifically things like matrices and so on, okay. So the thing for next time is to try and understand the so called affine transformations and how matrices naturally make an appearance when you want to study affine transformations.